Oh my goodness, welcome, welcome back to Waffle Free Storytelling. It's Tina Constant here. And because the jibber jab is at the end, you know we're jumping right into this week's story, which is called Obsidian and the King. Now, the king in question is King Manusa. He was a giant of a man. He was tall and strong, and it seemed that just because of what he looked like, he deserved his place on the throne. But more than his appearance, it was his stories of might and triumph that put him there. People from all over that great nation gathered to hear them. Just last winter, he said to the expectant and excited faces, I was climbing the mountain north of the land, right across the Black Lake. (gasps) And the people gasped. (laughs) There was a wounded snow leopard in the cave, and the people went ooh and ah. She was protecting her cub from a tiger, and the people swooned. (laughs) And the king would lean forward to capture the attention of every man, woman, and child as he told them how he saved the day. And the people would cheer. (laughs) That's pretty much how all of his stories ran, from outrunning jaguars to stopping volcanoes erupting to single-handedly fighting entire armies all to protect his people. And best of all, his favorite story, how he killed the beast of the Black Lake. As a result, he was called Hero King and Father of All, and his people worshipped him and believed in him, which was just as well, because the place that these people lived was dangerous. Creatures hid in the shadows and in the dark and in the depths, and the people had no reason not to believe in their king. Because ever since he had taken the throne as a young lad, not a single citizen had been taken by these creatures. As far as they were concerned, King Manusa was practically a god. There was one person who didn't come to these story gatherings. She was a farmer. She was tall and fiercely strong. But this farmer never spoke She hadn't done since the day that she was born. Her parents always said that the girl was too busy for small talk. And she was. As the oldest of ten children, it seemed that she was responsible for something from the moment she could walk. She supported her family. She ran the farm. She protected her siblings. She took care of everything and everyone around her. The people called this woman Obsidian, because on the one hand she came across so calm, so grounded and connected with the earth, and on the other hand she came across hard and cold. Obsidian didn't go to the king's gatherings because she had things to do. She stayed away because she knew how untrue those stories were. But she also knew how important it was for people to feel safe. And for them to feel safe, they had to believe in their king. And so she stayed away. Now, not knowing the inner workings of this farmer's mind, the king was infuriated that Obsidian never showed up at his gatherings. It's a matter of respect, he boomed out more than once. And from the walls of his castle, he would watch Obsidian carry out her daily routine. Every morning, every morning, the woman got up well before the sun rose and she walked through the forest to the shores of the Black Lake. She had swum to the middle of the lake, disappear beneath it for what seemed like an impossibly long time, then reappear on the other side. Without Breaking her stride, she'd climb up the giant cliffs, and only then would she stop. As the sun rose, she would sit on the ridge for a while. Then she'd walk home, gathering firewood as she went, and light the fire before her family woke. Rain or shine, snow or ice, Obsidian did the same thing without fail, never altering her routine. 
And because of this, people noticed. And they watched. And they quietly admired and respected Obsidian. And when things were particularly hard, they were sometimes heard to say, What would Obsidian do? Not what would King Manusa do, but what would Obsidian do? Well, of course, the king heard this too. And it was finally too much for him. So he came up with a plan to finally bring Obsidian to task. What he did was declare that his story gatherings were mandatory. Every person, man, woman and child, must without exception attend these gatherings on pain of death. Well, Obsidian heard the summons and ignored it for what it was. Not only did this not surprise the king, it delighted him. The next gathering came around. And the moment roll call was complete and everyone saw that Obsidian wasn't there, the king grinned a smug grin and ordered his guards to fetch Obsidian and take her to her precious lake. It was the middle of winter. The snow fell thick and heavy. Ice lined the edges of the lake. It was as close to frozen as you can get. People gathered around the water and watched Obsidian. Calm and quiet, with spears in her back, she stripped off her clothes, and on command of the king, she walked into the lake. And the people stared in horror, first at this quiet woman who had somehow become a cornerstone of their community without ever saying a word, and then at their favourite king, who suddenly seemed maniacal and terrified and deranged all at once. Without a sound, Obsidian sank shoulder deep into the freezing water, and she swam to the middle of the lake. From the shore, the people watched her tread water. How long could she possibly last in such cold, they all wondered. But no one said a word, until someone close to shore pointed out and shouted. There was a ripple, a ripple changed into a swell and then into a wave, and rising up out of the water was a serpent, the length and breadth of which they had only heard about in stories told by the king himself. It's the beast of the Black Lake, the people cried after. Save her, the people begged. This is what you do. You save cubs, you save children, you save whole nations. This is the beast you have already killed. Come back for revenge. Save Obsidian. All at once the king had an idea. If I save Obsidian, he thought, the people will worship me as their ultimate hero. There will never be any doubt. And so, without giving his wild idea any more consideration, he stripped off his kingly armor, got into a boat, and rowed out to Obsidian. By the time he got there, the snake had wound itself around the woman and was taking her under. The king waved to the crowd, as all acting heroes do, and he dived in. The cold stunned him to his core. He gasped, he took in water, he choked, he struggled to swim to the surface, but his limbs were frozen. He was dying, he had to be, because when he opened his eyes, he saw Obsidian sitting at a table at the mouth of the cave at the bottom of the lake, with the snake. Moments from what he thought was certain death, the king was aware of nothing except Obsidian reaching up, gripping him by the hand and pulling him to the cave beside her. Now to this day the king doesn't know how he was able to breathe, but breathe he did. Pay the toll, the snake hissed, and your people can live by my lake. The king watched as Obsidian reached into her mouth with a knife, cut off a slice of her tongue and handed it to the snake who devoured it. The snake then turned to the king. Pay the toll, and your people can live by my lake. 
The king began to shake. Then he began to cry. Then he began to beg and plead. Without saying a word, Obsidian rested a hand on the king's arm and stilled him. Then she picked up the knife again and she cut another slice of her own tongue. Satisfied, the snake disappeared into the gloom of the cave. Holding the king close and tight, Obsidian swam through the dark, cold waters and back to the shore on the other side, and the people cheered when they resurfaced. But the king said nothing. He didn't wave. He didn't so much as look at the crowd. He followed Obsidian up the shore, through the forest, and up the giant cliffs. They reached the top just as the sun was brightening the sky. Obsidian sat on a rock, facing the dawn, and the king sat beside her. For a long time, nothing happened. The king was just about to speak, to say something, to say anything, when a mighty stag stepped out from the trees. The stag gave Obsidian a sliver of his antler, and Obsidian swallowed it. A giant eagle then landed on a rock and gave Obsidian a soft down feather, and Obsidian swallowed that. A hummingbird hovered for a moment and let a drop of nectar fall from its beak. An obsidian swallowed that too. With the sun fully risen, obsidian smiled at the king and she got up and she made her way down the mountain, collecting firewood as she went. The king was speechless. For the first time in his life he honestly had no words. He followed Obsidian all the way to her home where the woman lit a fire and began to cook breakfast. Within moments, the kitchen table was full of noise and clamor and laughter. Her family ate and they talked and Obsidian listened and nodded and smiled and served up food until they were all done. Finally, the house was quiet and there was only Obsidian and the king and the king found his words. You have swum that lake and bargained with the beast since the day you could walk, the king said. And when Obsidian said nothing, the king left the farm and he returned to the castle. But from that day on, every morning, the king met Obsidian at the lake. They both swam to the middle and disappeared below the surface, only to resurface on the other side. They both climbed the cliffs and sat with their faces to the rising sun. They both let the stag and the eagle and the hummingbird heal their wounds. From where they stood, the people couldn't tell whether Obsidian and the king talked or if they just sat together in silence. All they do know is that the land was ruled from that day on with a generous and an honest heart. There were many stories, of course they were, there were always stories, but they came from the length and breadth of the nation. They were about the great and the small and the large and the little and the glorious and the quiet adventures of a happy people who loved their king, who now more than anyone was heard to say when hard things had to be done, what would Obsidian do? <laughs> there you go. Obsidian and the King. What uh, the story behind that story? Hmm. I think it is watching world news and seeing the noisemakers of all of our nations stand up and trumpet and shout and bellow and whatever they do. And uh, you kind of wonder how much they're really doing. <laughs> and it's in celebration of the people who really do keep our world moving. The genuine peacemakers, the doctors, the teachers, the fire people, the police people, the every, you know, the people who really make the world go round. The mothers, the true parents, the friends, the family. You know, often these people will do their magnificent work. Never be credited or even look for credit because that's just what they do and who they are. Ah, it's 
So big loving to you. <laughs> all right, I'd love to see you all around the fireside, hey? So drop around to www.tinaconstant.com. That is constant with a K. And uh, fill in the little form there. That puts you right at the fireside. And, uh, and that's it. Just oh, have a splendid day. Hug the people you love. And I will see you next week for more wild and woolly adventures from the Waffle Free Universe. Okay, bye-bye now.